Hello and welcome to Code Talk with your hosts Josh Block and Bob Lee. We're Click and Hack the Type It Brothers. <laughs> so, if any of you have not yet seen a Puzzler's presentation, here's how they work. We are going to show you five brand new Java programming puzzlers. See how I popped my P? I'm, I'm making the job hard for the sound man. And, um, each puzzle is a short Java program that doesn't necessarily do what it appears to do. And I'm going to show it to my brother, and he's going to try and figure out what it does, and then we will reveal the mystery. But it's not all fun and games. Each of these has a moral associated with it, and that moral will teach you how to avoid the trap, and you can take that knowledge back to your job or your school and avoid the bug forever. So, why don't I start today? This puzzle we call the first among equals. And in this puzzle, what we're doing is we're making a table mapping strings to numbers. I'll let you figure out what they really are. And then we're just going to count how many of the strings made it into the table. All right, let's take a closer look. We have a main method. Um, we, we're declaring an array of strings. It says, I came, I saw, I left. And something that strikes me is that we have uh, the letter I, the I repeated three times, or the word I, it's both. Um, and then we create a hash table that maps strings to integers, and we call it first index. Um, and then we loop through the entire array. Oh, it, and it's, uh, I noticed that it's from the end, from the last element to the first element. And for each element, we put the string at that index, uh, we map the string at that index to that index. So basically what this is gonna do, it's gonna start at the rightmost string and it's gonna work its way left, it's gonna put left, uh, and how long is this? Zero, one, two, three, four, five. It's gonna map left to five, it's gonna map I to four, it's gonna map saw to three, oh, and then it's gonna remap I to two. So basically what this is doing, oh, I see why you named it first among equals now, because it returns the first index for a given word. That's basically what this table is. And, and the words are equal to each and, other. Too. Oh, and those very, words very are equal clever. to each other. So we're gonna, we're gonna get zero, I is going to be mapped to zero. Um, and then we have a int called nmap, and we're looping over all of the words again, and each time we see one of the words in the map, we are going to increment this value. So this value I submit is going to be the same as the number of words in the table, which was, as we saw, six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And then we're going to print out the value of nmap. So I submit that this puzzle is going to print out six. It's hard to argue with that. Let's see if it's one of our choices. Uh, yes, that would be choice C. Let's ask the audience what they think that this does. So how many of you, by show of hands, and participation is mandatory. <laughs> I, uh, believe that this program won't print out six, but will print out choice A, zero. I see two of you, but you're brave. Three, three brave people. How many brave people think that it'll print out four, um, which somehow it like eliminates the duplicates or something? Ooh. Uh, I would Ooh. say that's about a quarter a, or a third of you. Put your hands up high so I can get a good count. Third of a... Oh, that's, that's a half. See? That's about a, by my count, by my estimation, it's a third of a 2,000 person audience. Okay, that's a thousand of you. <laughs> All right, and choice C, uh, how many people agree with my brother and think this program prints six? Uh, it's a couple dozen of you. And then how many people think none of the above? Well, clearly all the rest of you. Um, so the winning choice would appear to be choice B4, right? Let's find out what it really does, shall we? Ooh, fancy. What? Yeah, zero. The intuition, and the, the two or three of you brave souls, pat yourself on the back. Um, the intuition here is that the hash table contains method, just doesn't do what you want it to. Let's see what it actually does. See, here we're declaring this as a hash table and calling its contains method. And if you look it up under hash table, it says tests if some key maps into the specified value. <laughs> value in the hash table. So this better be a value. The values are all integers. 
but we're running through the strings, the possible keys. And of course, the keys are not found in the value position. So that, that's awful, isn't it? Yeah, what do we do about it? Well, I'm glad you asked me. The first thing you do is you follow the advice in effective Java. I'm sure you all have copies of that book. And you always- I have two. Excellent, I have two as well, the old edition and the new edition. Um, and I, you declare collections using their interfaces, not, not their implementations, that's silly. And once you do that, well, gosh, your IDE won't even let you screw up. IntelliJ will say, whoa, you know, it won't even suggest contains, because that's not a method on map. It's a, it's a kind of a, an old hash table method that you shouldn't be using anymore. What if you don't use an IDE? You mean if, if you're rocket old school with Emacs, like I sometimes do? Um, well, then Java C will tell you that you screwed up with this fine error message. And then once you've been told that you're a fool, you go like this. Do, and you fix it. You, you write what you wanted to write, which is contains key, right? Makes sense. And that, that's what your IDE will suggest for you. You'll do it, and then it'll print six, just as my brother Bob said it should. So what's the moral of this story? Well, we got a couple morals. First moral is always declare collections using their interface types. So map from string to integer equals new hash map. Um, for API designers, don't violate the principle of least astonishment, which states that every method call should do the least astonishing thing given its name. If I got a hash table and ask, does it contain Harry? You know, it's astonishing that it's looking in the values rather than the keys. So that does violate the principle of least astonishment. You'll know that you violated it if your API users say, what? Exactly, exactly. Well said. Um, and, and by the way, don't, don't use hash table anymore. Hash table is pretty much obsolete. If you're using the thing um, serially, then use hash map. And if you're using it concurrently, use concurrent hash map. It scales like nobody's business. It's a wonderful class. You can run you know, thousands of threads against it, and it just works. It's fast. Dougley wrote it. I need say no more. Cool. That was uh, tricky, but if you think that was tricky, I have one for you. All right. I call it proxy fight. And we have this cute little kitty, and we love her so much that we are going to use serialization to create a copy of her. And, and then we're going to check our results. Any, any standard design pattern that this demonstrates for us? Uh, yes. We don't want to serialize the kitty directly no, 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 because it's, kitties are serialization aren't proxy serializable. Pattern. So we use the serialization proxy pattern. Right, right. Yes, it's, it's some book. I, I read about it. I swear I did. Anyway, all right. So um, let, let, let's take a look at it. And by the way, these are adorable little proxy cats. Um, so, what do we do? Well, the first thing we do, I see cat implements serializable, um, and then, uh, which means we can, you know, store it and read it back in, uh, and we have a write replace method. Um, write replace, as you guys may know, it basically nominates a candidate to be serialized instead of the object, the so-called proxy, you know, because you might want to not actually serialize the poor little pussycat himself, you get a better representation of the pussycat. That's the proxy. And that's what is serialized. And then when you deserialize it, you have um, a read resolve method on the proxy that is serialized. And it basically turns the proxy back into the cat. So let's take a look. Um, what does the right replace do? It simply creates a new proxy object. Nothing could be simpler than that. That's kind of you know, about as simple as this pattern can get. Um, and the proxy class itself, how does it look? Well, uh, once again, it's, it's got nothing. I see no fields there at all. Um, and when a proxy comes in, you simply create a new, a new cat. So basically, if you serialize a cat, it emits one of these proxy cats. And when you deserialize it, you get a brand new cat. Now let's look at the main method and see what it does. Uh, we got a byte array output stream equals new byte array output stream. So that's what you do when you're testing serialization. You serialize it into like a byte array and then out so you don't have to worry about any files or anything. It's the easiest way to test serialization. Um, we get an original cat called uh, new, a new cat. So that's good. And now we take our byte array output stream, we wrap it into an object output stream so we can actually write the cat to it, and then we call write object um, on, ooh, this shouldn't say new cat, this should say original. Pretend this says original. There's a bug on this slide that we just discovered now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
And now, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, now we, we deserialize him. How do we do that? Well, we take the byte array um, and, sorry, we take the byte array output stream. We call two byte array to get its byte array out of it, get the bytes. And we you can tell that whoever designed this API really fell in love with the Gang of Four design or uh, Gang of Four decorator pattern. Yes, yes, yes. Too many decorators. Now we wrap the byte array in a byte array input stream, and we wrap that in an object input stream so we can pull objects out of it. And we do pull an object out of it by calling read object. And we know that the object is a cute little uh, proxy cat. And so we, um, no, actually it should be a cat. Uh, and so we cast it to cat. Um, and that's the copycat. So we have the original cat and the copycat. Finally, we print out whether the copycat equals the original. But that's like a no-brainer, right? Because the proxy always creates a new cat. So we're finding out if a new cat equals an old cat. So actually, bug or not, it doesn't matter. This program would print out false. OK, let's uh, see what the audience thinks. First of all, again, everyone participate. How many people think the correct answer is A? and that, this, uh, that the equals method returns true and that the cats are equivalent. Uh, we got a couple back there. Show How the many... courage of, of your convictions. I think there's more than a couple, but they're not raising their hands high. Think about it, think about it. How many people think the correct answer is B and they agree with my brother, false? All right, ooh, that's about a third, quarter? That's, I'll give it a quarter. Um, how many people think the correct answer is C and that this method throws an exception? Did you say that's about half? Half? Yeah, a third, half, a, something like that. It's a half yeah. plus a quarter plus a half dozen. I don't know. I can't count. How many people think the correct answer is D? None of the above. Always a safe choice. <laughs> uh, no votes. All right. B before we proceed to the wait, right wait, answer. They get lonely if they have no Ooh. votes. Are there no, no votes? votes? I'm no going to change my votes if no one votes. No votes. We're going to have to change oh, the answers. Oh, we got answers. one for none of the above. We have one. We're going to have to change the answers All right. the next time. And shall we see what it really right. does? Let's see who got it correct. The correct answer is C, throws an exception, and specifically a class cast exception deep in the bowels of deserialization. Ooh, well, So, what's and the going intuition on? here is that, and it's not a class cat exception, note. Oh, a class cat exception. <laughs> you are clever, aren't you? So, and the intuition here is that write, <laughs> replace, and read, resolve fail for circular references. Well. Let's take let's a look at this Aww. thing. Oh, poor, poor proxy cat. So show me right, what's really going on here. Let's take a closer look. So we had this class, but note that this is an inner class, not a static nested class. Uh -oh. And as everyone knows, an inner class has an implicit, or an inner, inner class instance has an implicit reference to its enclosing instance. So this proxy actually has a reference to the cat instance. Um, and whenever we go to deserialize our cat, um, we fail during the read object method. Give, give me some more details. What's really going on? So what's going on here is that write replace and read resolve in, during serialization, they fail in the presence of circular references. And specifically the way they fail is that when you're serializing something, the Java serialization framework will call write replace on all instances, even circularly referenced instances. However, when you go to deserialize this proxy, it is not symmetric. Java serialization will call read resolve on the outermost instance, but when you have a nested instance, it doesn't bother. And worse, it tries to take this proxy object and store it in a field of type cat and it fails spectacularly with that weird class cast exception. And what makes this particularly insidious is that things serialize just fine, and you don't actually find out about the problem until perhaps weeks later. Or months. Uh, or months later, when you try to de deserialize this and realize that your data has been corrupted. Lost forever. Lost forever. That, that is a sad story. So this has to be a bug. What's the spec have to say about all this? Uh, this is actually by design. Um, <laughs> design? <laughs> <laughs> you call it design. Okay, they might have wrote the code first and then baked this into the spec when somebody complained about it. <laughs> this is a good way. I I'll bet someone like filed a bug and then they fixed the bug by writing this into the spec. I'll bet. <laughs> Let's read the pros and, and then we'll, we'll move on. All right. So specifically, the spec says that in cases where an object being serialized nominates a replacement object whose object graph has a reference to the original object, that is our proxy to our cat, 
Deserialization will result in an incorrect graph of objects. Thank you. Furthermore, if the reference types of the object being read, the ones nominated by write replace, and the original object are not compatible. Say proxy, like cat and proxy cat? Proxy is not assignable to cat. Uh, the construction of the object graph will raise a class cast exception. Well, if we just read this on page 159 of the serialization spec, we yeah, could like, have avoided who, this problem altogether. Yeah, like who reads altogether. the serialization spec by show of hands? Thought so. All right, so simply put, Read, resolve, and write, replace do not work in the presence of circular references. At least Ouch. not with some hoop jumping. So what, what can we learn from all this? Uh, oh, how do you fix it? Sorry. Oh, well, first of all, the way we fix it is that we just turn this into a static nested class as we first intended. It'd be nice if that was a default, by the way. It uh, would. But you just do that by adding static. Then we say bye-bye to the circular reference, and our proxy deserializes just fine. And this prints what my brother thought it would. False. Because the copycat is different from the original cat. Correct. Now, uh, what can we learn from this? Uh, a few things. As we said, re uh, write, replace, and read, resolve don't work in the presence of circular references. Uh, also, the ser serialization proxy pattern does not work in the presence uh, if, if the proxy object itself refers back to the original object. Like this can happen if you have a collection and it contain that you want to serialize and it contains an object that refers back to the collection. Um, there, are, there are some arcane ways that you can work around it, and if you want to see them, check out MapMaker and Guava. Check out the source code. Uh, and and the real, uh, one of the main morals of this story is always uh, make your serialization proxies uh, static, that is, static nested classes. Um, and then furthermore, make sure that you unit test these things so you don't find about, out about these problems in production uh, after you've lost your data and you can't recover it anymore. And for system designers, when you're implementing de serialization and deserialization logic, and any type of complementary logic, logic for that matter, uh, make sure that you provide symmetric behavior uh, so you don't surprise your users. I, I beg to differ. I, I think perhaps there's one more moral here. Uh, don't use serialization. <laughs> All right, I have one for you, and um, I'll tell you in advance, it's another hairy, or, or should I say furry, furry problem, like the cat, you see. Um, sorry, all right, this one is called creation miss. Um, and in, in this problem, um, we have a couple of enum classes representing Adam and his wife, Eve. Um, and all we do is we check if Adam's wife is indeed Eve and if Eve's husband is indeed Adam. And, and um, why don't you tell me what the program prints? It seems simple enough. Um, I'm going to start at the top. We have an enum man with one value named Adam, and it passes a value to its constructor, um, Eve, and the constructor assigns that value, Eve, to the wife field, which is final. And we have another enum woman that has one value, Eve, and we pass Adam to the constructor, and the woman constructor stores Adam in the husband field, which is also final. Now let's take a look at the main method. We have a Boolean, Adam has Eve, and it checks that Adam's wife is equal to Eve, so that'll be true. Um, and we have another Boolean, Eve has Adam, that will check that Eve's husband is Adam, so that will also be true, I submit. Uh, and then we print out, uh, these two values concatenated, so I think it will print true, true. I suppose it would have to print that. But let's see if it's one of our choices. Ah, it's choice A. Very good. Um, so let's ask the audience what they think the program prints. How many people agree with my brother and believe this program does print true, true? One? A smattering. One? No, I count about four or five That's of it? you. And I should tell you, every night we make it a point, almost every night, almost. to have one puzzle that actually does what it looks like it does, though usually for a different reason. So this could be that puzzle. Anyway, true, true. How many votes for true, true? Hands way up. Half All dozen right. of you. How many people go for true, false? Choice B. Ooh, another half uh, dozen. Uh, it's like an even dozen, but you don't seem very up. sure of yourself. Uh, how many people go for choice C, false, true? Ooh, that's better. About, about a quarter of you. And how many people think none of the above? Ooh, I'd say about um, more than a half. Well. Let's find out what it really does, shall we? Who's right? Well, it turns out that what? more than half of you are right. Yep, G give yourself a hand. No pointer exception. And the intuition here is that 
man and woman have a circular class initialization dependency. So let's take a closer look. And unfortunately, the only way to analyze class initialization in detail in Java is to manually simulate it, to just walk through it. You can do it either yourself or you can use it, do it using an IDE. In this case, we're going to do it on the screen. Um, Josh, I think you've gone nonlinear. Perhaps I have. Um, anyway, so the idea is that initialization starts from the top and ends at the bottom. So let us take a look at what happens. First, the VM says, hey, we're running creation, but there's really nothing to do there in terms of initializing creation. So it just runs the main method. And the first thing it does there is it's got to call, evaluate the right-hand side of this assignment. Uh, it begins with man.atom. So we're looking at the atom field of man. That means we have to initialize the man class. And so we start at the top of the man class, right? And we go up to here. And um, the first thing we do there is we're going to create an instance um, of, of, we're going to evaluate the parameters here, create an instance, not create, we're going to reference the Eve field of woman. So now we've got to initialize woman, right? So now we go down into woman, and the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to create Eve, which means we have to evaluate her arguments, her man, her Adam. We look at man.adam, and we say, gosh, we better initialize the man class. But wait! Our thread is already initializing the man class. What do you do when you have an initialization circularity like that? Blow Anyone up. know? Blow up. Yeah, yeah. Let, let the audience. I, I heard them say ignore it. So audience gets credit for this. You ignore it. You just blast on through. And that's what we do. You read the contents of man.atom. It would get set up here when this line finished, but it hasn't finished yet. So it's kind of pre-initialized. Anyone know what the value is when it's pre-initialized? Null, it's null. So sadly, we pass null into the constructor of, of um, Eve there. Um, and then what does this constructor do? It stores the null into the husband field of Eve. And now we are in big trouble. Now, that constructor returns, and we create an atom. Um, and so we're down here in this constructor, and we properly store Eve into Adam's wife field. So that's good. Um, and returning from that, we initialize the Adam field of man. But it's too late. We've already read the null out. So even though we're putting the correct final value that can never change in now, we saw it before the final value was set. Well, now we go down to here. Um, we say, read the wife. We check if it equals woman dot eve and adam's wife in fact was set to woman dot eve so this returns true as it ought then we set eve has adam to woman dot eve dot husband which is what null equals man dot adam oops null equals anything throws a null pointer exception and it's game over so what do we do to fix it well there's two ways to fix these things. You've got to break the initialization circularity one way or another. Either you do it manually or with lazy initialization. In this case, I've chosen to do it manually. And the way I do it is that man depends on her woman, but not vice versa. Uh, I've seen relationships like that. But anyway, um, so what we do in this case is that um, the man will tell his own wife that he is her husband. So inside the constructor for man, we get wife.husband equals this. Um, and so the woman now is very, very simple. Um, the husband field is no longer final because it's set after the creation of the woman. And we just wait for our man to tell us who our husband is. So now let's run through the initialization again. This time through, we say man.adam, OK, initialize man. We need woman.eve. Initialize woman. Well, all we do is set eve equal to a new woman. No work to do, no problems. Um, and then we create um, an instance of Adam, and we're calling this constructor. We set our wife to Eve, and we set Eve's husband to Adam. We tell our, our lucky wife that we are her husband. Um, finally, we return. We're back down here, and we check if Adam's wife equals Eve. It does. If Eve's husband equals Adam, it does, and it prints true, true. Make sense? Wonderful. All right, and what can we learn from this one? Wow, first of all, circular 
dependencies in class initialization are dangerous. If you have one, all hell can break loose. You will see static fields in their uninitialized states, which is zero for ints and false for booleans and null for object references. That's like the really bad one. And these things can infect objects of those types. It can violate your, um, you know, uh, it can violate things and all hell breaks loose. Enums are particularly prone to the problem because they begin with expressions that create instances of themselves and the best way around this is keep your class initialization simple. Because Java automatically initializes classes, um, you know, it's hard enough even if you keep them simple. If you have any doubts, if you think you might have a circularity, step through it by hand or in your IDE. And if you do have a circularity, break it either using this manual final, final initialization or lazy initialization. And I'm a huge fan of lazy initialization. Specifically in this case, we could have one enum named person with an abstract method called get spouse. And that would be more politically correct too, by the way. Yeah, yeah, good point. <laughs> All right, now I have one for you. I call this puzzle, what the F? All right. Josh, please consider the following variable are you, declaration. Wait, wait, are you allowed to, to say that at strange loop? Is that allowed? Okay, what the good. Oh, and I see you've got an F hole up there. Very nice. <laughs> All right, continue. <laughs> All right, consider these, this is a short one. Consider these two variable de declarations. Which of these, this is a little different than what we've done so far. Which of these compiles? Uh, neither one or the other or both? Well, uh, let's, let's take a look then. Oh, also, uh, let me take a moment to thank Alexi Shipilev, who tweeted this puzzle. Yes, this is the first originally. puzzle we've ever seen that began its life as a tweet, which is why it's such a nice short puzzle. All right, so this actually looks very easy because I know that a short is 16 bits long. And furthermore, I know that a hex digit is four bits long. So here, we're taking four hex digits, which is 16 bits, and trying to store them in a short, so that fits. Here we're taking eight hex digits, and I see, by the way, you've used the underscore, which is a nice Java 7 feature. Let me take a moment to tell my brother that we're on perfect time. Stop looking at your damn watch, buddy. All right, so. <laughs> and, um, so this is four times four is 16 bits, and we are trying to shove 16 bits into, sorry, 32 bits, right? Eight times four is 32. So we're trying to shove 32 bits into a 16-bit bag. And you can't do that. So this one's illegal, and that one's legal. So I, I would have to say that A is legal, B is not, and that would be choice A. 16 bits into a 32-bit bag. That's quite the euphemism. Let's see what the audience thinks. Um, how many people think that the answer is A, and that A is legal, i.e. it compiles, and that B does not? About a half dozen? More than a half dozen. Put your hands way up. I, I, I've got friends out there. <laughs> a dozen. Give me a dozen. All right. Let's see how many people think it's B that B compiles and that A does not. Anyone? One. One guy back there. One guy. All right. How many think that the answer is C, that both A and B are legal? I think that's 90% of the audience. It's about right. How many does that leave? Uh, D, neither A nor B compile. Uh, that's about a quarter. About a no, quarter. no, it's 10%. 10%? Ten percent? To oh, yeah. yeah. I guess 90% plus 25% right, right. doesn't add oh, up. Shall we see what's really going on here? Uh, let's, let's see the right answer. Who's right? Oh, a B. A compiles, but B does not. And the what? information here, yeah. That is perverse. We're initializing short variables with int literals. So let's take another look. Let's take another look let's at take this. Another look. I don't believe this. Let's take a closer look. So first of all, let's look at this value, 0x FFFF. Also note that uh, short values are signed and that their values must be, be between negative 32,000 and positive 32,000. And what, what is that? That is a two, uh, negative two, two to, to the 16th. 15th. Two to the 15th through two to the uh, 15th minus one. Exactly. Um, and then let's take a look at this first value. Now note that both of these things on the right side here are int literals. 
And the first one is 0x FFFF, which is about 65,000. So it's twice as big. It's clearly greater as than the maximum short. Into a so, short. The, so the, and the compiler can tell com at compile time that this shouldn't be allowed. Whereas, who can tell me, uh, well, actually, this slide can tell me, which, <laughs> what the value <laughs> of 0x, this int literal, FFFF, FFFF, obviously that's uh, with all the one bits set. And that in negative two's, or in two's complement is negative one, which is a valid short value, and the compiler allows it. It's like right in the middle of the range. Yep. So it fits very well. Yep. Very All comfortably. Right. Well, uh, how do we fix it? Well, the fix is simple. We just uh, basically with the, 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 uh, with, with the first one, we can just cast it to a short. And this will be an explicit cache, and basically it'll take the bits and assign them to that short. And with the second one, really what we were doing is we were trying uh, you know, we, we just make this a little less misleading. Basically, we were stripping off the high order bits in the last example. So in this case, it's really equivalent to assigning it to 0x FFFF and also casting it to a short. So now but, both- But it, you would have gotten the same value if you had left the 16 bits in there, That's right? That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And what is that value? Uh, this is, a, so now both declarations are actually legal now. Yeah, and, and, and what does it get initialized to? Uh, which one? Both. They're the same. <laughs> Negative one. Negative one. That's a nice number. I like it. All right. And what can we learn from it? A few things. First of all, Java lacks short and byte literal. So we're, we, we're stuck having to assign an int literal to a short, um, even though we need it. Uh, and if the int literal is in the, uh, is in the, I guess, the allowed range for a short or a byte, the si compiler will just silently cast it for you. Yeah. And... Um, also, just like int, the short and byte types are always signed, which is the unfortunately... The byte type is always it's shine, not really, signed. It's not, it's not really what you want. Yeah, who, who um, would design a signed byte type? So to, uh, to obtain a uh, short or a byte with a high bit set, you actually have to cast an int literal or use a negative, and it'll set that bit for you. Um, and notice that like hex binary and octal literals can be negative even without the minus sign. You notice we had 0x, ff, ff, and it was actually a negative number, even though there was no minus sign in that literal. So I guess the, the real moral of this story is to avoid short and byte uh, because they're, they're painful to use and they're, they're seldom what you want. They're, they're second class citizens in Java. They're, they're basically just deficient ints. You yeah. almost always want ints. Yeah, really the only time you would use them is if you have like a packed array of shorts or bytes. And then for, you know, for language designers, provide for God's literals, sake! <laughs> provide literals for all the built-in types and so, you don't, so your users don't have to jump through these hoops. Um, especially for byte, for gosh sakes. And then also, please, provide unsigned uh, primitive types, especially byte. And by the byte. way, to, to any language designers in the audience, both of these things could be fixed in Java without breaking anything. We could still add those literals. Please do it. Well, let's do it. All right. Um, now, I have one last short problem for you. I call this one Mad Max. Um, and this is a, a kind of a um, simple problem. Um, and in this problem, we simply have a method that calculates the max of its variable number of arguments, and we test it. And I want to know uh, what it prints. Let me check it out. All right. I'm going to start at the top. We have a static method that returns a double called max, and it takes in a var args list of double values. And this, so this is really just an array of doubles. We can, we can effectively treat it like that. Mm -hmm. And on the first line here, oh, you're doing something very good. You're checking the preconditions. Uh, if vals.length is zero, that is, they didn't pass in any values, because you can do that with varArts. Mm -hmm. um, we throw an illegal argument exception, and we blow up quickly with a nice clean error. Mm -hmm. uh, then, in the case where we have one or more values, uh, we assign the result to double.min value. Um, and then we iterate through the values, and if a value is greater than our current result, uh, starting at double.min value, well then we assign that value as our new result. And at the end, we simply return that result. Um, let's look down here. Now in our main method, we calculate the maximum of negative one, zero, and what's that number, uh, Josh? That would be negative e. Negative e, that's unnatural. I suppose it is. And clearly, the maximum uh, here is zero because these two numbers are negative. So I submit that this method is going to print zero. Well, that makes sense. It is the maximum of its arguments. Let's find out what our audience thinks. How many people agree with my brother that this program will print 0.0? .0? It's floating point, so that's, that's the way it prints it. 
Thanks sure, for doing that one What else could it be, right? Um, how many people think that this program will print 4.9 times 10 to the negative 324th? I think you're making these too easy. Uh, eh, I'd say that's a, a few dozen of you. Maybe 35, something like that. A few crazy people in the audience. Uh, how many people think it throws an exception? About the same, a few, few dozen. And how many people think none of the above? Something else. Better be a lot of you. You all have to vote. Let me, one last time. I want to get some good numbers here. Now nah, we don't have time. So we'll, we'll just say, what won? What's the, what's the winning choice? Who knows? It's, it's, we're, it's unclear. Let's find out what it really does, shall we? It was a tie between C and D. All right, C and D. Oh, you're both wrong. Uh-oh. It turns out that this program does indeed print 4.9 times 10 to the minus 324th. And the intuition here is that double dot min value is very different from integer dot min value. See, while integer dot min value is the most negative int, double dot min value is the positive double with the smallest magnitude. So it's the tiniest, it's the quantum of doubleness, that makes, let us say. That makes perfect sense. It makes no sense at all. It's terrible. <laughs> so how do you fix it? What is the equivalent of integer dot min value? What is the real lowest double value? Uh, negative infinity. Negative infinity. So you could say result equals double lot negative infinity, and then it would work. But you could do something much better than that. Check this out. If you declare it as double first and then var args double rest, then it'll blow up at compile time instead of at runtime if you don't pass in anything. It won't even match the declaration. And moreover, you don't need any sentinel value to initialize the thing. Um, you, you simply initialize it to first, iterate over the rest, and if anything is greater than your candidate, you replace the candidate. This again prints 0.0, .0 and I submit to you and all of you that this is the correct solution. And what can we learn from this? First of all, the least double value is double dot negative infinity, not double dot min value. Same is true of float. Second of all, if you need one or more of something, declare it type first, type dot 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 rest, and this generalized to two or more, three or more, and so forth. Um, for API designers, don't violate the principle of least astonishment. Don't have like double dot min value and integer dot min value mean something completely different. Be consistent in the use of your names. So a summary Actually, of just let me stop you there for one second. All I right. think the real moral of this story is don't use floating point. <laughs> yeah. Especially not for money. I would say so. All right. So, it uh, looks like we've got three more minutes, just enough time to finish up. So, a summary of the traps that we've told you about. Number one, always declare collections using their interface types. Number two, if a method requires one or more args, declare it with t first and then a var args list, and this requires you to pass in at least one element. Number three, always declare your serialization proxy static. Or don't use serialization. And number four, Circular dependencies and class initialization are dangerous. To break them, finish initialization of one class manually or lazily. Number five, avoid short and byte. They are painful to use and sell them what you want. And for system designers, language and API, number one, don't violate the principle of least astonishment. Two, be consistent in the use of a name parts, also known as words. Yes, indeed. And three, provide symmetric behavior for serialization and deserialization. And number four, provide literals for all built-in types. For God's sake. Especially byte. And number five, provide unsigned primitive types. So, in conclusion, Java is still, as of Java 7, a reasonably simple and elegant language, hint, hint. Um, but it has a few sharp corners, avoid them. The best way to do that is to keep your program short and simple. And if you aren't sure what a program does, well, then it probably doesn't do what you want it to do. A, a good way to find these bugs before they bite you is to use a program called Find Bugs, which you can download from the web, written by our friend Bill Pugh and his graduate students, or a fine IDE, such as IntelliJ. And finally, don't code like my brother. Don't code like my brother. <laughs> and if for some strange reason you actually liked this talk, buy this book, and this, just in case you have any doubts, is a plug. A plug. shameless a plug. plug. Shameless plug. Shameless plug. <laughs> Swipe yellow. All right. And if you want to, like, you know, contact us and, you know, marriage proposals or... <laughs> we, have, we have two endpoints. <laughs> All right. 
So thank you very much, and we hope to see you again next year. Thank you very much.